Our keynote speaker for the day is uh, Dr. Michael Gottesman. He is the deputy director for the intramural research program here at the NIH and has been since 1993. He's a graduate of the Harvard College and Harvard Medical School. Dr. Gottesman completed an internship and residency at the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital in Boston. He was a research associate at NIH from 1971 to 1974. He returned to Harvard Medical School as an assistant professor before returning to NIH in 1976. He became chief of the Laboratory of Cell Biology in the National Cancer Institute in 1990. From 1992 to 93, he was acting director of the National Center for Human Genome Research, and he was acting scientific director at the NCHGR in 1993. And I'm not sure what that stands for. I'm a proponent for plain language, so I'm sorry I didn't look that up. During his 26 years of service in the public health service as a commissioned officer, he achieved the rank of a two-star rear admiral as Assistant Surgeon General. I didn't know that, Dr. Gottesman. That's pretty good. <laughs> he has been actively involved in initiation, initiating several training and mentoring programs for high school students and teachers, as well as college, medical, and graduate students. As Deputy Director for Intramural Research at the NIH, he has initiated an NIH-wide lecture series and reformulated tenure and review processes in the intramural program. His research interests have ranged from how DNA is replicated in bacteria to how cancer cells elude chemotherapy. He has published extensively on these subjects with over 500 scientific publications to his credit. He is an elected fellow of the AAAS and the American Association of Physicians since, nine, since 2003, as well as the Academy, American Academy of Arts and Sciences since 2008. His scientific work has been recognized by highly competitive awards such as the AACR, Rosenthal Foundation Award, the Milken Family Medical Foundation Cancer Research Award, the ASPET, A-S-P-E-T Award, the ASB, MB, Burt, and Natalie Valley or Valley Award, and the DHHS Secretary's Award for Distinguished Service, among others. A very accomplished gentleman, Dr. Gottesman is, and a very nice man. We thank you so very much for taking the time to be here to support this Healthy Building Initiative. It's very important, and we understand that you understand how important it is, especially being on the campus of the NIH. I would like for all of us to please give Dr. Gottesman a round of applause. Dr. Michael Gottesman. Thank you, Michelle, for that um, overly kind introduction. And it is indeed a pleasure for me to be here. Um, the issue of um, buildings at the NIH and throughout the country, the health of those buildings, the efficient use of energy, the efficient functioning of people who work in those buildings is a matter of great importance to me. And I really appreciate the opportunity to make some comments, um, which may be slightly different from things that you'll hear from the real experts about these issues. Um, the title of, the, of, the, uh, of this year's um, Health in Buildings Roundtable is Health in Buildings for Today and Tomorrow, Making Connections. And this is really about bringing a lot of people together to collaborate on solving a myriad of really interesting and important problems. Now, this is not the first, as I mentioned, this is not the first such conference at the NIH, but it is the first time that we can announce the Scholars Program which is an effort to bring the brightest early career uh, uh, scientists, architects, people interested in um, health and buildings uh, together to, to help to contribute, to provide creativity and innovation 
to contribute to the problems that we all would like to solve. Um, I know the scholars, I think some of the first year scholars are here today and I wanna give my heartfelt uh, welcome and congratulations to the new scholars. You'll hear more about this from the next speaker. Um, most of you know something about the NIH. Obviously, the people who work here know quite a lot, maybe more than they want to know. Um, but I thought I'd begin by telling you a little bit about NIH. Um, NIH is a federated structure with 27 institutes and centers, um, all of which in one way or another support research. Uh, 24 of them support research uh, on this campus and on associated campuses. Um, although most of our research activities are in Bethesda and our main hospital is, is in Bethesda, uh, we have facilities in Baltimore and Detroit and Phoenix, Arizona, uh, Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, and in Hamilton, Montana. Each of those has a certain flavor. Each of them, of course, has uh, structural issues that need to be individually solved, and I really applaud our uh, Office of Research Facilities that manages to keep all of our buildings running uh, under not always the best of circumstances. Um, now, I oversee, as Deputy Director for Intramural Research, I oversee research not only in our laboratories, but in our clinical facilities, such as the Clinical Center, which is at the core of the NIH in Bethesda, um, and in, in a, a lot of population-based research, or, or as some people call it, epidemiology. Um, and, and I must say that um, one of the key features in the infrastructure for all of these elements uh, are the buildings, the facilities in which we work. NIH itself has about $10 billion invested in research buildings on this campus and the others that I've mentioned. Um, and we are constantly seeking ways to improve the quality of our research facilities and to create healthy interior spaces um, for our, the people who work here. This includes attention to the laboratories in which we work, to our research hospital, or what we call the clinical center, uh, to the extensive animal facilities on and around this campus, um, at, which have special needs, as you might imagine, and to our many office spaces. The NIH Healthy Building Initiative began in 1994 as an initiative to review building and design practices to make buildings healthier and to develop public awareness, educational, and design guidelines towards this goal. Uh, the Health in Building Roundtable, or as we know it affectionately, HIBR, was started in June of 2010 uh, after the U.S. Green Building Council Federal Summit in Washington, D.C. The concept of health in buildings includes not only improving the health of individuals who use the buildings, but improving the efficiency of these buildings to maximize energy use and improve the function of anyone who's working in the buildings. Throughout the country, these ideas have already had an impact on the construction of new buildings and on improving our urban environments. Um, there's a lot more to be done. Determining how to measure the effect of improvements in lighting, ventilation, water supply, interior materials, and aesthetics is challenging. Developing metrics to measure the success of our efforts will be, I think, one of the goals of this and other roundtables. Outlining research goals and developing a research agenda are other important goals for the meeting ahead, and you've gotten a list of specific areas in which people will be providing information and encouraging discussion. Um, before I close, I would like to address two issues related to healthy buildings that have come to my attention in my role as Deputy Director for Intramural Research. Um, these issues have been uh, and will be in the future subject to research at the NIH, and I thought you might find them interesting because they're a little bit um, out of the normal range of issues that you think about in healthy building design. The first has to do with an area of research emphasis at the NIH, the human microbiome. Um, as you know, recent research has suggested that we are a compilation of many, many different organisms. We're a synergistic organism ourselves, populated with microorganisms of various types on our, on our skin and inside um, various orifices, which play an absolutely critical role in whether we're healthy or whether we develop disease. What is not as well appreciated is that we ourselves are constantly contributing our own microorganisms to the environment in which we live and work. Um, each human, apparently, on average, disseminates 37 million bacteria into the environment every hour. 
these organisms, and think of how many humans there are and how many hours there are. So that's a lot of microorganisms. These organisms populate the space that we inhabit, and the interplay of these various microorganisms determines the microbiome of our homes, our hospitals, and the spaces in which we work. More and more evidence suggests that there are healthy microbiomes, a constellation of microorganisms that encourage health, and those that predispose to disease. These are pathogenic organisms that are, the, are responsible for a lot of infectious disease. In a hospital setting, for example, evolutionary studies of a new building and one in which patients are being seen suggests the rapid establishment of a pathogenic bacteria on the surface and in the air, despite being surrounded by benign bacteria outside of the building. So when the building is built and you analyze the bacterial distribution, it looks like the bacterial distribution of a benign uh, external environment. Very quickly after patients are brought in, um, that changes, and you begin to see lots of pathogenic bacteria that are responsible for what we call nosocomial infections. These are infections that people acquire in the hospital. Um, Florence Nightingale, who you all know, 150 years ago, observed that simply opening windows in a hospital, letting in the good microbes, reduced wound infections considerably. In other words, she, by opening the window, she created a, a much more benign microbiological environment. New hospital design, including single-pass air, which I have to say our hospital has, and ventilation systems that allow good microbes to predominate, must deal with these new observations about the microbiomes in buildings. If you're interested in reading more about this issue, there's a wonderful book by Ed Young, who was here recently talking about this, entitled I Contain Multitudes, The Microbes Within Us, and a Grander View of Life. And the last chapter in that book is entirely about the microbiomes of the, of the spaces that we inhabit. Now, another related area has to do with um, the spread of pathogenic bacteria, particularly very antibiotic-resistant bacteria in hospitals. Um, and we had a study done in the NIH Clinical Center um, several years ago. Uh, lead um, investigators were Julie Segre, who is a senior investigator in the Genome Institute. By the way, NCHGR stands for National Center for Human Genome Research, which is now called um, the National Human Genome Research Institute, because we change, we, the, once people learn the abbreviations, we change them as soon as we can. Um, and uh, Julie and, uh, and Tara Palmore, who is our hospital epidemiologist, um, actually uh, identified all of the cases of an infection called Klebsiella, which was um, a carbapenemin, re very resistant bacterium that actually resulted in the death of several people. Um, and they analyzed the genome of these organisms to figure out how they spread from one part of the hospital to the other. Um, and unlike most epidemiological studies in which there's usually a sort of um, spread from one area and, and then adjacent areas get involved, uh, it was evident that these bacteria were moving from one part of the hospital to a distant part of the hospital. And so the question was, how was that happening? Um, and by analyzing the genomes, they could see very small genetic differences uh, identifying the initial organisms that got into the hospital setting, and then uh, each sequential change in organism that indicated closely related organisms and probably uh, immediate transfer from one part to another. Um, and strikingly, the organism was moving all around the hospital at somewhat great distances. Um, the conclusion of that study, which um, is really quite important and I think has affected hospital procedures for in, in throughout the world, is that um, most of the spread of this particular organism occurs not through the ventilation system, but actually by people who are probably physicians and nurses and other healthcare workers who are not thoroughly washing their hands and are carrying the organism across distances in the hospital from one place to another. Um, and only by doing this genetic analysis could they demonstrate that kind of unequivocally. So as a result, uh, our hospital and many others have very strict rules about uh, washing hands. And if you're ever in a hospital and the doctor comes in to see you and he hasn't or she hasn't washed his or her hands, say to them something like, oh, don't you think you should wash your hands before you touch me? Because <laughs> this is really very important and it's now uh, a, a key issue in terms of patient care in hospitals. Now, um, Dr. Segre and Dr. Palmer also found that um, the bacteria persisted in the hospital, uh, not only on certain kinds of surfaces, 
but actually in the plumbing system. And um, they could find deep within some of our sinks uh, evidence of bacteria that had been there for quite a while. And so this suggests that the design of plumbing systems that uh, don't allow the continued growth of bacteria is really very important. And I know this will influence us in, in our future hospital design. So um, I also want to say something else um, about the environmental effects of uh, buildings on our own well-being, on the way we feel, and how that actually affects our ability to recover from illness. Um, and it's been discovered that aesthetics, such as the openness of public spaces, the availability of exterior views uh, from windows within the building, affect the sense of well-being of the occupants. Uh, and in hospitals, may even accelerate recovery from illness. And um, I'm saying this um, because uh, there was this uh, work done by a former NIH investigator, Esther Sternberg, who is in the audience, who I just noticed in the audience, which is great. And she's written a book about these mind-body issues in a, uh, uh, entitled Healing Spaces, the Science of Place and Well-Being. So a little bit of a, uh, a, a kind of uh, advertisement for that book, which I have read and I found very interesting. I hope others have read it as well. So another important area of endeavor at the NIH is the creation of a diverse and inclusive community of scientists here. Uh, the NIH Intramural Research Program hopes to be a model for um, assembling such a diverse workforce with the hope of channeling the creativity and the diversity of ideas into a broader community of, uh, of people who can meet the scientific challenges, both in our laboratories, in our clinics, and in the design of safer, healthier buildings. Uh, let me close by hoping that this conference allows the participants to make contributions to building a program that is strong, sustainable, and focuses on creating healthy buildings for everyone. This will include identifying areas of research that can contribute to this goal and applying this research to building design, construction, and landscaping. I want to thank everyone for coming to the NIH for this important conference and wish you best for every success in the conference. I also want to, even though many, many people are involved in making this conference successful, uh, our collaborating uh, institutions, many people at the NIH, um, I think you can tell that Michelle Coley, who um, is the uh, program manager for the HIB, HIBR program, uh, really brings an enormous amount of energy and enthusiasm to the subject. I want to thank her personally, um, and also Kenny Floyd, who's the uh, director of the Division of Environmental Protection, who under whose auspices 